Hello, everybody. I am Laura Sheehan, a career coach and strategist and the co-founder of Empowering Perspectives. I'm speaking to you today from Tokyo, Japan. Every month, we talk to a guest who can provide us a glimpse into her or his life, the challenges they have overcome, and the wisdom they can now share. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Uyanga Erdenabold. Uyanga is a public relations and diplomacy professional with over nine years of experience working for the U.S. Department of State and in nonprofit NGOs. In her role as the cultural affairs specialist at the U.S. Embassy in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Uyanga managed a portfolio of 15 exchanges and scholarship programs, served as the U.S. Embassy's main point of contact for over a thousand alumni of various U.S. government exchange programs, and was in charge of alumni programming in Mongolia. She also served as an advisor and manager for the board of directors of the Mongolian Association of State Alumni, an active and dynamic association that she helped to build. Now, what is extra special about Uyanga is that she is the first blind Mongolian to receive the Fulbright Scholarship. She completed her graduate studies in library and information study science, pardon me, at the Louisiana State University. She conducted professional internships at the Library of Congress and at the Maryland State Library. Most recently, Uyanga worked as the program manager for the Tomodachi MetLife Women's Leadership Program at the U.S.-Japan Council in Tokyo, Japan. She currently serves as an executive board member for the Council on Diversity and Inclusion at the U.S. Embassy here in Tokyo. An avid dog lover, Uyanga is one of the founding board members of Lucky Paws, the first animal rescue and advocacy group in Mongolia. As the owner of the first ever guide dog to work and live in Mongolia, Uyanga is also an advocate for service animal accessibility. She is here today to talk to us about the loss of her sight, her amazing accomplishments thus far, and her incredible vision for her future. Uyanga, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. There's so many wonderful things to say about you, Uyanga, and so many great things I think that people can learn from you and from the incredible path that you've walked so far. And I wanna start out by highlighting for everybody that you had a TEDx talk in 2014 called Understanding and Acceptance in a Challenging World. And in that talk, you introduced the audience to your first guide dog, the first guide dog in Mongolia, the beautiful Gladys. And you spoke about bias and the lack of understanding. And what I loved about the beginning of that talk is that you leveraged the quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is a great accomplishment. And you followed up by saying that doing so is also a challenge. I love if you could talk us through some of the challenges that you have already overcome and beginning with going blind, not being born blind, but gradually over time going blind, attending a school for the blind, where the only expectation was that you would graduate and go to work in a factory, learning English, applying for the Fulbright Scholarship, returning to Mongolia then and being barred from almost every building because you had your guide dog with you, and facing a job search where everyone turned you away. How in the world do you begin? Um, yeah, I mean, when you list it that way, it it does sound it does it does sound. Um, um, I'm not. I don't want to say impressive, but yeah, it does sound kind of deterring, right? Um, but yeah, I mean that that was the things I did and the things I had to go through um, in my life. And I think a lot of people, the concept of challenge um, is relative. And a lot of people, I think, try to compare the challenges they're facing with the challenges that other people have faced or have overcome. And on one hand, that is a good practice and that that's something I do too when I, whenever I'm being especially frustrated with my son, <laughs> for example, <laughs> who's three years old and sometimes it can be challenging to manage him. But on the other hand, 
I do feel that everybody's challenge is relevant and just as difficult and worthy of sympathy and support um, in their own right. And so um, in my case, yes, I was born sighted, um, but my the condition I suffer from is called retinitis pigmentosa, RP for short. And it's a degenerative condition where I lose my eyesight or I lost my eyesight, I should probably say, uh, very, very gradually uh, over, uh, I guess over a span of 20 years since I was born. And so um, as a child, I could see as a toddler, I think I probably had a normal, normal eyesight. And then when I was four years old, my parents noticed that I was, you know, standing too close to the television. And that's when I was diagnosed with the condition. And um, I started going to regular school when I was eight years old um, with normal sighted children. And then by the time I was nine years old, ready to start the second year of school, I couldn't read my print books mm -hmm. and it was just too challenging. And so at, the, at that time, my parents had to uh, you know, face the music, so to speak, and they um, sent me to a special school for the blind. And one of the reasons why my parents were reluctant to send me to that school in the first place was that it was located in the capital city. So there was only one school for the blind in all of Mongolia, and it still is. Um, and where we lived was about maybe 150 miles away from where that school is. We lived in a smaller town and which meant that they would send their nine-year-old daughter to go live in a, a boarding school in a dormitory. And so, you know, they weren't thrilled about it, but they, they had, if they wanted me to learn to read and write, they had to send me there. So yeah, so I went there, I graduated and uh, this is early 1990s to early 2000, when Mongolia was just like other the former Soviet countries, we were going through, you know, economic recession, political reform, everything upside down, poverty, um, you know, shortage of everything. And so, so yeah, I mean, we faced lack of resources, we had um, uh, lack of properly trained tra uh, teachers, and, you know, sometimes we even had lack of food, but um, we graduated, I graduated in 2000, yeah, in 2000. And at that time we studied for eight years. Um, but if you wanted to go to college, you have to have 10 years of secondary education, which our school did not provide. And so because I wanted to go to college, I went to regular school well, for to complete the, the requirement of 10 years. So I went back to my town and went to um, re regular local high school for two years and graduated and went to college and I studied English. And then um, by many very, through many uh, lucky circumstances, I, um, got introduced or, or I learned about Fulbright and I applied for it. I got Fulbright um, and I went to the States to do my master's. And I came back with the very first guide dog of Mongolia, as you mentioned, Gladys, um, which actually was one of the, the most, one of the best things that has ever happened in my life, I guess with the exception of my son and my uh, family. Um, and then I worked for the US embassy in Mongolia for over seven years where I met my husband and now we live in Tokyo. So sorry if I, sorry no, if I didn't perfect. answer your question directly. I think I just summarized my life for you there. <laughs> but I think that's exactly what people need to hear is to, to get a, an overview of, of all the things that you went through. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go back and dig into just a couple of things, because in both your um, the final two years of secondary school and mm -hmm. in college, you had to have a lot of help to get through that. 
And I would love it if you could tell everybody about how how you did that, what what you had to do to get through those last two years and your college years. Of course, yeah, it was it was extremely challenging. I mean, I was a teenager who was gradually losing her sight and knew that she would eventually go blind. And so I was dealing with that as a 16, 15, 16 year old. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was faced with the prospect of deciding whether I should go with the flow and just go work. There was a factory for the blind uh, where a lot of, uh, I don't know, I would say like 80% of our graduates went to work and that would have been the easier path. Um, but I really wanted to go to college. I really wanted to, I, I was a very, very curious person and I wanted to, I loved, loved reading. And so ju I just wanted to, you know, continue studying, being a student. And so I talked with my family. And so one of the things my parents did for me was when I had to go to live in uh, the capital city to go to study at the special school, because I was going to be away from home living in a dormitory in a boarding school, my parents couldn't bear the idea of me being so far away, even though my grandparents and my a lot of my relatives lived in the capital city and they would of course take very good care of me. But then my dad was just so um, troubled by the idea of being so far away from me. He actually quit his job um, and moved to the capital city with me. I still ended up living in the boarding school, but my dad was in the same town and he would come visit me all the time, bring me what I needed. And he would get me from the school over the weekends, you know, take me out and we would go do things. And so my dad, my parents lived apart for four years um, because, you know, my dad wanted to be close to me. And then after four years, my older, my older, older sister um, graduated from high school and she came to study at the university, Mongolian National University in the capital city. So she could keep a closer eye on me. So then my dad moved back. And so my ha family had to do a lot of uh, sacrifices or a lot of changes in order to support me. And so that I would feel feel connected and I would feel comfortable and not as homesick, you know, as the other kids were. And then I finished and I went back to my town and went to regular high school. And so the first year I was there, uh, my dad suddenly passed away. Mm. And so that was a very, very difficult time for me because, you know, I'm dealing with teenagers who you know they they don't know better so they don't know how to support me they don't know how to be my friend and there's no accommodations or student support office there that's that just doesn't exist um and you know I've had teachers who would tell me like if it would have been kinder to your family if you didn't insist on this you know if you were just at home you would be doing your family a favor and so I was going against that kind of attitude, um, not everyone, but uh, for the most part. And at the same time, my dad suddenly dying. And so, and then, but I went through, I uh, finished the high school. Uh, you know, I even got <laughs> in, when was it 10th grade or ninth grade? I got yelled at by our math teacher who I actually honestly think that she's a very, very nice person and mm -hmm. has done so much to help people to l learn math. But she yelled at me on the first day for disrupting the class because I was taking notes in braille, but she thought I was just, you know, just like knocking on the table for fun or something. 
And she yelled at me and I was horrified, you know, because I, and I didn't say anything. I was, I just stopped taking notes Mm. and I didn't know to tell her, you know, I'm sorry, teacher, but I'm blind. And this is how I take notes. And so I I was a kid. I was whatever, you know, 16 years old. And I, I couldn't say that. And I was embarrassed from the rest of my classmates. And so things like that. You know, I mean, it's not hugely difficult compared to a lot of things that people had to go through. But to me at the time, to my 16 year old, that was a a challenge. And I give myself credit for, you know, sticking with it and day after day going to class and knowing that how much I was embarrassed and uncomfortable. So, and then I finished high school and then it, you know, the, my, my main purpose or goal was going to college, right? And so, but then the question was, nobody knew how I would take the college entrance test. Because in Mongolia, um, you have this nationwide college entry test that you take and depending on how high you rank um, in that subject, you you would be you would be given options to choose from universities and but people didn't know how to do that how a blind person would do that because it has never been done um at least in my town and so you know again people were why are you insist why basically why are you being very difficult (laughs) you know and so Again, I was young, I was a kid. All I knew was to, all I knew was I wanted to do that, but the rest of the negotiating and, you know, talking to people, bringing them on, uh, on my side, that was all my, all my older sister who was, uh, who was a, uh, a university professor at that time. And young, very young faculty member at that time, my older sister. And so she really advocated for me. Um, And my family never had any doubt in that I could achieve what I wanted to. And they never said, you know, you are making it so much harder for me or for us or anything. If anything, they would have been mad at me if I was lazy, you know, so So yeah, so I ended up taking the entrance test and I went to the University um, of uh, Humanities and uh, I graduated in 2006 um, with honors. And then, um, yeah, and then I, I had my first taste of looking for a job as a blind, you know, recent graduate with a, a degree in English language. And I quickly learned that, uh, you know, it might be really long time before I get a job. And so I ran into this person called Peter Marsh, who um, was at the time the director of American Center for Mongolian Studies. And he told me, have you heard of this program called Fulbright? And I was, uh, I wasn't even thinking about studying overseas, I think. And he was like, why don't you give it a try? And I looked at it and among other things, it uh, it requires a person to have a TOEFL score, Mm -hmm. an IPT TOEFL score, which I didn't have obviously. And at at that time, Mongolia also didn't know how to administer it also to a blind person. And so I immediately thought, you know, oh, I can't do it because I don't have a TOEFL score and I don't know how to get it. And I, I did, I mean, I did, tried to get it and I talked to the test centers and they told me the only way you might be able to get it is if you went to Beijing or Moscow, you know, our neighboring two countries. And so I didn't have the funds or the time, the possibility to do that at that time. And I I decided, okay, I cannot do it. And then Peter said, you know, fill out the application and uh, maybe we can see if the public affairs office might be open to receiving yours without the TOEFL score. And that's what happened. The the public affairs officer at the time um, agreed to review my application without the TOEFL score. And um, 
I was invited to an interview and I passed and um, I was uh, one of, I, received, I got a Fulbright scholarship, but even after getting the Fulbright scholarship with the help of the US embassy, I was able to take the TOEFL test in Mongolia and I um, uh, got a pretty high score. And then I also did have to take the GRE test which was not easy, <laughs> especially <laughs> the, the math. Part. But yeah, so, you know, a lot of things that has happened um, has, not, has not been easy, uh, mostly because I think a lot of people had to be educated in the process. And a lot of the thing was for me to, to come up with the courage to try it even when nobody else has done it before. Well, I love too, that also in your TEDx talk, you mentioned a quote from Dr. Dana Whitley that said, there are two primary choices in life, to accept conditions as they exist or to accept the responsibility to change them. And I, I think I'm gonna credit that quote and, and your embracing of that quote to how you and I got to know each other because we both arrived in Tokyo at the same time and immediately recognized for, for different reasons that the community needed a space for co-working essentially. And together you and I embarked on this quest to create this space. And there were all sorts of no's and all sorts of questions and all sorts of whys and it took, I think, what, close to six months, I guess, yeah. but, but we did it. And I think that's just a very tiny, tiny example. And it really, the endeavor pales in comparison to the tasks that you have undertaken in your life in, in Mongolia, where you kept hearing no, 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 or it's never been done before. Um, and you just kept pushing through and finding ways to move forward. I yeah, I think the difference there is, so I would say a lot of people, when I talk about these things, they might think that, you know, my life was filled with this very mean people who didn't want to help me. And I don't want people to think that because that is not true. I had people in general are well-meaning and supportive, but they need to be educated. They, um, you have to explain to them why you want to do this, for one. And for two, some people want to know, is it worth you or me committing this much effort mm -hmm. for you to do this, right? And then the third, I would say the most challenging part is people don't know how to do it because this has never been done before. And because you're the one who really want to do this, you end up having to figure out how to do it, basically pioneering things, you know, every step of your life, which I think sounds really, you know, uh, grand and everything, but it, it, it is, it can get really, really exhausting, you know, and you just want things, people to know how to do things and for you just get there and fill out the application and <laughs> <laughs> yes. they, they do it right but you have to figure it out for them you know you're the customer you're the person who trying to receive the service but you end up figuring out how to provide that service and then being able to benefit from it and so that is the most challenging part so people will say I understand your concern we have never done it before so we don't know how to do it and there aren't any experts we can consult because this has never been done before. And so you have to say, okay, what if, what if I was to figure out a way to do it? Would you help me, you know, implement it? And they, most people are open to that. So you end up having to figure it out all the time. I love this negotiation strategy too, that you take with a lot of the things that you under, that you undertake. And mm -hmm. That reminded me of a of the great way that you described how Mongolia received you and Gladys when you first brought back brought Gladys back from the states, and the way that you described her or the experience was that um, returning to Mongolia with a guide dog was the equivalent of walking around with a flying cow, <laughs> because, 
because people, dogs in Mongolia were, are there to protect their people and their property. And the idea of a dog that is there to help, to help a person or to guide a person and to be kind to everyone around them was just completely foreign. Yeah, I mean, so people see dogs, I think, in Mongolia or used to see dogs. Now, a lot of things have changed because of that, you know, advent of technology and everything, uh, modern way of life. Um, but as I, when I was growing up, dogs were guards, guard dogs or herd dogs, right? They help with um, nomadic people. Um, with herding sheep or protecting them from wolves or you know protecting their properties things like that so dogs were never kept as pets they they loved their dogs people loved their dogs and appreciated their dogs but not in the sense of pet living in your house and you know and um the, you know getting their nails trimmed and you know that kind of way yes. not, not in that way and so me showing up in Mongolia with my guide dog was now, when I think back, was a very bold and also very uh, something only a 20 year old might do, 24 year old might do, right, at the time. Um, now, if I were, I, you know, now being 37, you know, I, I might reconsider that. I might think, is it really fair either to Mongolia or my dog for me to bring this dog to Mongolia and, and expect to be able to have accessibility. But I was 24 and I, I didn't think about those things. All I knew was I love having a guide dog. This gives me greater mobility and I love, love my dog and nobody can separate us. So we're going home together. You know, that's how, <laughs> that's how I thought. Which really set off then a whole sequence of events, which goes back to both your leveraging of your connections and your understanding of modern technology because and I'll just tease out this story a little bit but it was when you were in the Fulbright uh, Commission right or when you were working on the Fulbright scholarships that mm -hmm. you were putting together a Fulbright Alumni Association to help build awareness for the program in Mongolia and one of the Fulbright alums was a very popular TV host at the time. Mm -hmm. And he came to an event, met you, said, Uyanga, I want you on my show. And he said, all right, I'll go on your show. If you become the president of the Alumni Association, <laughs> right? I mean, good for you. But then that, that both negotiation and opportunity did two things, right? It, after that show, and I'd love for you to give more detail here, but after that show, it was, didn't you say it was overnight almost, relatively speaking, yeah. that the attitude towards you and Gladys changed because so many people saw that show that then they saw you on the street and recognized you and then understood that Gladys was there to help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, most definitely. The, I am, I'm very, very grateful to that show for giving me that opportunity. And again, this shows my lack of um, maybe marketing skills or, you know, I, I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me to maybe try to go on a talk show and talk about what service animals or guide dogs do to someone like me. Uh, you know, I, it never occurred to me. I was upset. I was, all I knew was to be upset that people were not understanding what Gladys meant to me, you know, what, how, how essential, how, I don't, I don't even have to describe, it's like asking me to cut off my right hand. Um, I cannot have a normal life without my guide dog, you know, and so when people, I, I kind of, I think, automatically expected people to understand that. And when they didn't, I was upset. And I thought, you know, these are mean people, which was not fair, because I never gave them the chance to learn what Gladys meant to me. And of course, Mongolian people reacted, um, you know, not as welcoming at the beginning, because Gladys, 
people have never interacted or ne have never seen a guide dog before. So it's like me coming there with a flying cow and saying, this is normal folks, you know, yeah. haven't you seen a flying cow? What are you surprised about? You know, it's the right. same thing. Now I realize that thinking back and then, yeah. And then, so that um, gentleman who was a well-known journalist and a TV personality, and he, he's also a very well-known economist um, who came to our alumni conference and he saw me presenting and then he said who's that person with the white dog and he came and talked to me and he was like you you need to go on my show and I said you know um maybe if you are very interested in getting me on your show why don't you become the president of our alumni association and that was that was the deal we made um, I went on his show he became the president of our alumni association made it hugely popular and got us a lot of grants from a lot of big companies. And he has done so much for um, creating awareness about disability and just general social equality and justice. Um, and I went on his show and almost overnight, I mean, it, it's, it's still on YouTube and all, almost overnight it became so popular. A lot of people saw it and I think it had like I mean, Mongolia is small, um, but it had like 20,000 views or something crazy like that. And people recognized me walking around with Gladys and they, they, they didn't, you know, in the past, they would pull their kids away or they wouldn't get on the elevator with me. They would cross the street to get away from my scary dog, you know, so, but they stopped doing that. And instead they would come over and say, Hey, we saw you on TV, and is this is this your smart dog? And and that kind of became Gladys's nickname, you know, like the smartest dog. Um, and people were so warm and loving towards Gladys. So it it was, and that that opened my eyes to the importance of educating people before complaining, you know. So I. Um, and another friend of mine, actually a person with disability, told me when and when I was, you know, again, I think um, kind of worked up about some of the things I faced. She told me, well, if you don't do anything about changing it, what's the point of complaining? You know, so and then I, I realized, you know what, the, the rule should be. And this is my rule still in life, not just because I'm blind, just as a person. I, I, th I, don't, I, think, I don't think it's fair to complain about something unless you have tried to educate people on what you want them to do for you or what you need them to understand about your views or values. Unless you have made that, unless you have not made that effort, you don't have the uh, right to complain because it is not everybody's business to know what others need, right? I, for example, don't know what deaf people might need or what mobility impaired people might need. Um, I don't know many things about a lot of things. And this it's and it's only human. Uh, we cannot know everything about everything. And so if you want people to treat you fair, if you want people to um, work with you, you have to first take the effort and time to educate. And after you've made that effort, if they're still being, um, uh, what's the politically correct word? If they're still being not nice, mm -hmm. then you definitely have the right to complain. Um, and, and you can complain loudly and you know, energetically, but I, so that is my rule now. I, I, have, I try to educate people. I try to tell them what I need and work with them. Yeah. And he, even here in Tokyo, I mean, I've learned so much from you in terms of, because from on the other side of the coin, I think people are nervous to ask sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And I was, I was nervous to ask. I wasn't sure, you know, how to introduce myself, how to interact mm -hmm. with your, your current di guide dog Dunaway. And mm -hmm. it was so wonderful of you to explain to everybody. In fact, you had a, a, a great gathering for kids here to show them a movie about how guide dogs are 
trained mm. and then to talk to them about how we shouldn't interact with the guide dog when the guide dog is working because the guide dog needs to know the difference between work time and play time mm. and how helpful it is to you. And I, it makes so much sense, but how helpful it is to you when we see you to not just say hi, Uyanga, but to say hi, Uyanga, it's Laura. Yep. <laughs> and whoever else is around so that you don't have to memorize all of our voices, but that you know exactly who it is by us helping to identify ourselves when we see you. Exactly. I mean, I, that that is one thing I think people I I get I think maybe um, more grateful uh, when people say identify themselves when they talk to me um, than than you know I uh, other people would normally get right because if people if somebody says hi Oyanga then I'll say hi but I don't know who that person might be. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what to say. And it creates an awkward situation. <laughs> Whereas if somebody says, hey, Uyanga, it's Laura, then I know what to say. I know, you know, wh what our last conversation was or, you know, stuff like that. And also I've had so many awkward situations where you might be walking into a room and somebody says, hey, and you think that, is she saying hey to me? Is she saying hey to someone behind me? But what, what if she was saying hi to me and I didn't say anything, then I would look rude. But what if I said hi, hey to her back, but she wasn't talking to me? What do I do? What do I, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. And then I've had so many times when I, <laughs> when I said hi to someone who was answering their phone, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I cannot see them. Right. And they keep, continue to talk, but they're talking on the phone and I'm thinking they're talking to me. So I keep on talking to them, but they want me to be quiet. You know what I mean? Oh. Like it's, yeah. So I've had many, I mean, that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other things that happen when you're a blind person that you just live with it. You just learn to laugh it off, but which you is know. so important for everybody to be able to do, you know, just go out and try and see what happens and laugh it off if it doesn't work out sometimes the way that you think it's going to. Oh, most definitely. I mean, you know, learning to go somewhere is, is a challenge. Like for most people, when you move somewhere new, going to a Starbucks is a piece of cake. But for me, it's learning every step of the way and how to find teach my dog how to find the handle of the door and once you're inside wh where is the counter where do i pick up my drink and how do i teach my dog to locate an empty chair and then afterwards where do i throw away the cup like those every single step of that mm -hmm. i have to make a conscious effort to learn uh, and that's just one starbucks right and so everything when you're blind, everything takes um, a lot more time and effort to learn something that people take for granted, something that's so easy for others um, that you can't do. And so sometimes like I have to call my younger sister on FaceTime when she's working and, you know, ask her, is this my green sweater? You know, uh, am I Am I wearing two supremely clashing colors and look ridiculous? You know, so I have to check things like that. And so these are things that never occur to people, but it it happens to me and it takes a lot of time and effort, but that's just how my life is. And if I am constantly bothered by that, and if I feel constantly, you know, that it's unfair that my life is like this and others have it so easy, then I cannot live my life and I would forever be frustrated. Um, so you just have to make your peace with whatever you, ha you have um, and try to improve on it. So. Well, this I feel like transitions so well into one of the other amazing things that you have done, Uyanga, and that is that as you were just talking, it was reminding me of a conversation that we had about welfare-based laws and rights-based laws mm. and how in Mongolia until recently there were no rights-based laws for people with disabilities working in Mongolia mm. 
there was no, it was just assumed that the state would be taking care of them instead of anyone with any form of disability working and earning an income on their own. Hmm. Could you tell everybody a little bit about how you leveraged your contacts and your experiences to change that completely? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I had some experiences as an individual. When I first started working at the embassy, um, there were some, I think, tax issues that need to be dealt with and nobody knew how to because, again, <laughs> nobody has had to think about this before. You know, in Mongolia, um, there is a system I think it probably is still there, I'm not sure, but when I was, uh, as of 2010, um, and I think until 2017, actually, it was still the case where people with disabilities are ranked, or I would say, what's the word? Um, they're assigned a certain percentage based on the level of disability they have or the, the lack of ability they have. So it's based on lack of what you cannot do that determines what category you go into. So when you are blind in both eyes, you are classified as 80 to 100% loss of ability, employable ability. And so I was basically classified or categorized into the group where you you cannot possibly expect this person to work. And so the state, the government would take care of you and provide the allowance. And therefore there was no tax provisions in the law for someone like me to pay employment tax and you know income tax. How do I pay income tax? And then you know if you are suddenly dismissed from your work, you have uh, unemployment benefit, right? Based on the taxes you were paying. And I wasn't qualified for that because, because of my disability, I wasn't expected to pay taxes. And if you haven't paid employment or income tax, you are not qualified for unemployment tax, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would, I mean, I would joke about it with our accountants and, and people like that. I still paid my employment tax, even though I wasn't expected to. I paid seven years of employment tax. But when I, when I uh, finished my employment with the embassy and left, I couldn't get the unemployment benefit, um, which would have provided me with like three months of uh, you know, uh, allowance or something. I couldn't get it because <laughs> I'm a disabled person, even though I have been paying the tax for seven years. So anyways, so the stuff like that, the law was kind of built around the the idea that people with disabilities would generally be recipients of social welfare and they would not work. And my thought was, why are we classifying people based on what they cannot do instead of the other way around? Why can't we assess people? Okay, you're blind, but what can you do even with the loss of your sight? And based on that, categorize them. You know, if someone is in a wheelchair, what can you do, you know? Um, so I thought it was a completely backwards way of looking at it. And I, it's not just Mongolia, it's a worldwide um, trend. It has been like this for a long time. And then a lot of Mongolian legis legislations, and I think even here in Japan, I've done some um, reading about Japan too, a lot of it is based around welfare. The legislations, when they address issues of people with disabilities, it's always in the light of welfare. Um, and it hardly ever mentions rights issues. And so ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, was the huge groundbreaking legislation that US passed. And it took years and years of work, obviously, for the Americans with disabilities to get that done. And so I was talking with my colleagues and, you know, I was the first 
blind employee at the U.S. Embassy. And I think one of my achievements there was also normalizing that a colleague with disability for my colleagues at the embassy, you know, it became a normal thing. Like they were no longer inspired by me. <laughs> they, <laughs> they knew I could be annoying just as the other person. They know that I, you know, I'm a person. I am not this inspirational figure or I am not a person to be pitied. You know, there were people who disliked me very much. There were people who liked me. They, there were people who knew I like drinking white wine and I like karaoke and, you know, they knew me as a person. So it became a very normal relationship, which I think is what's lacking in a lot of places. And so we talked and we said, you know, what if we were to facilitate a talk with the Mongolian government folks and the people who worked in ADA? Um, that might help instead of us saying, yes, it's true. Because this is based on this one incident where a, there's a person called Andrew Imperato. He was the president of the American Association of People with Disabilities. And he we invited him to come to Mongolia to talk about disability awareness on a program, speaker program. And he came and he was scheduled to meet with uh, the head of the Mongolian Parliamentary uh, Committee on Social Welfare and Education and Human Rights. And I was assigned as his interpreter. And so uh, we showed up at the government we have communicated this in advance to them that I will be working with him and everything. We show up and there is a crew of media to cover the meeting, but there's also police and guards and they wouldn't let me in. And they said very, very politely and nicely that maybe I should leave my dog with them and they will assign somebody to guide me. Uh, and I said, no. And they thought I was being unreasonable. And and so my public affairs officer at the time, she was adamant. She was like, if my staff is not allowed in with her dog, this meeting is not happening. And at the end, the parliament member came out to meet us mm -hmm. outside on the steps of the parliament house, government house. And then the media, of course, pounced on it. And then Afterwards, most of the media ran a story with something like America trying to tell us what to do, Americans trying to defile our government house by bringing a dog in, you know, and then also saying that I was the, you know, the, the Mongolian who went to study in the US and now she thinks she knows everything, you know, so m most of it was very, very negative. And then we said, okay. So let's try to educate them. So we decided to have a round table with Andrew Imperato and a lot of the journalists, we invited them from main newspapers and TV stations. And they attacked me personally when we were there. And it got to a point where I could no longer translate objectively because uh, I got upset <laughs> and I left the room. And somebody else had to take over, but one of the things they said asked was from Andrew, they asked if a Mongolian person, and this at this time, President Obama was the president of the US. And she asked if a blind Mongolian turned up in, in the US with her guide dog, would you allow her in with her guide dog in, in the White House? And Andy said, absolutely, no question. And she said, I don't believe you. <laughs> no. And so after that, he went back to the US and then he sent a picture of President Obama with one of his advisors who actually happens to be blind and who had a guide dog to us to send to Mongolian media. And that's what we did. And then we followed it up. And after that, you know, there were some discussions and I was still kind of recovering from the media um, negative attention. And then we decided to do a um, what we call a teleconferencing uh, program with the lawyers um, of, who wrote Americans with Disabilities Act. And some of the major advocates, Judy Human being one of them, she's very well known, not just in the US, but inter internationally. 
for being advocate of disability rights. And so we arranged for her to come visit Mongolia. And then we also arranged for people to talk with um, the people who wrote Americans with Disabilities Act. And we've done so many things. I mean, it would take so much time to talk about all of them, but eventually what ended up happening was Gladys, my guide dog, ended up going into the government house. She became the first ever dog to set foot in Mongolian government house. And when I was accompanying Judy Human on her visit in Mongolia as her interpreter, and our ambassador at the time, Ambassador Campbell, Campbell, Piper Campbell, she worked months for this to happen. She wrote so many letters and talked with people, ministers, parliamentarians. She was adamant about it. And there was one point where I always remember this because the government required Gladys to wear shoes and Gladys hated shoes. Oh, yeah. That'd be yeah. hard. <laughs> And I was so angry about, well, I guess I not angry, but I was so irritated by it because it was just such a, a small petty um, requirement that didn't change anything. But, and I, I remember saying that, I didn't know the ambassador was still in the room. I thought she had left. So I said, I was angry. And then I said, I don't care, I don't care. And the, <laughs> and the ambassador had, she was right next to me apparently and she goes but I care you know and so I put on Gladys's shoes and we went and this happened it was very successful and everything and not only we passed a law a Mongolian version of Americans with Disabilities Act a right-based legislation for people with disabilities in Mongolia in 2014 but we also went from people saying no to my dog and you know yelling at me for bringing dog to a minister saying that he wants to start a guide dog school in Mongolia. You know, so it, I mean, it just goes to show you that people, it, it might take time, it might take effort, but if you take the time and trouble to explain to people, people, understand deep down we are the same we are well-meaning um, people and we sympathize and mongolians were no different if anything i think mongolians went from knowing zero to accepting it very very quickly compared to other countries so i give mongolians a lot of credit and i um i still think that you know mongolia was the country the 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 country for for Gladys because she was not born there she was born in and trained in California but she lived and died in Mongolia she uh, lived in Mongolia the rest of her life and so you know we've done a lot and a lot has changed but obviously I got married and I moved and I couldn't continue what I started but you know I I really do take comfort and encouragement in knowing that we started it and the law is there now. If someone with a guide dog goes to Mongolia, there's a law in place providing guaranteeing access. It's incredible. And I know here in Japan too, you've worked hard to educate both Americans and our Japanese counterparts on um, the services of a guide dog getting your dog certified here in the Japanese guide dog system, as well as having already gone through the American and international certifications. Um, in your most recent role as the director for the, the program director for the Tomodachi MetLife Women's Program, Women's Leadership Program, where you led a hundred young women in getting ready to transition from college into the workforce and all of them across the entire country here in Japan, being able to see you as a leader, see you in the program director role and to watch how that program came together so well and to be inspired by both each other and by the, the program as a whole. It, it just, you continue to empower so many people at different levels. Yeah, I mean, I was I was the program manager, so yeah. Right. Program manager. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> just, to, just to make that clear. Yes. Um, but also, yes, I mean, it. it is a, I think one of the messages, sometimes I feel like, especially working for a program that has leadership in its title, women's leadership, and I think our understanding of leadership might be a little bit limited. You know, we take, we understand leadership in terms of success, especially career success, right? Uh, our title, our name cards, the events we attend, the types of uh, clothes we wear, people we hang out with. We define leadership by that, by career success. But I, when I worked on that program, what I really, really wanted to see was to tell girls that real leadership is deciding who you want to be and sticking with it. You know, it doesn't mean all of you should be lawyers and managers and, you know, be really sharp and aggressive and everything. That, that maybe that's Hollywood interpretation of success. But in real life, um, if you want to be, if you meet, meet someone that you love, and you have a family and you provide for them and you make their life happy and successful and give them security and confidence. And if that makes you happy, that is your success. You are a leader. You are leading, you are leading your children. You are leading others. You are providing comfort and care for others. I think that is very much because people think that unless I'm a leader, unless I'm I'm doing it all, I uh, my ma life is meaningless. You know the FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. I think that is at the core of a lot of un. Uh, what's the word like um, unhappiness and dissatisfaction? Because, for example, you and I we're spouses. We are what what's called a trailing spouse. <laughs> we follow our husbands around. Um, and yeah, it does get frustrating. It does get disorientating. It does, it does require you to kind of have, have to reinvent yourself and find, center yourself and find meaning in your life. But I, I'm starting to realize that leadership, again, is, is a concept or a word that's being overused and when we, and overused only in one context, you know? So I wanted to tell those girls that you know, it's not that you have to um, have to lead companies and, you know, be impressive and uh, fly business class. No, that's not leadership. Leadership is giving something, seeking what you want in life and finding it and then sticking with it, even if it's hard. Just like marriage, right? If, if I think people kind of feel like marriage is an, a result or an end in itself, but it's a process. It's, it's, it's something you have to work at. So it's kind of like working out, I guess, you know, if you work out one day and then all day, 24 hours work out and then not work out for, you know, seven days. No, it doesn't work like that. It takes effort every single day. And you cannot, even if you worked out for 10 years and then you left it, um, you go back to you ruin the result, the, the effort you put in already. So you have to work at it until the end. So it might be some, I mean, it can be kind of a daunting prospect for a lot of us to think about it that way, but I think it is that way. And, and your consistency and your determination and self-discipline, that is, that is success, that is strength and leadership. So whenever you exert or display those qualities, you're being a leader. That is amazing. Thank you, Uyanka. That's a perfect way, I think, to probably wrap up our, our conversation for today. And I, I do have one last question and that, I guess, two parts. Hmm. What is next for you? And second part, are there any other bits of advice that you'd love to give to this audience? Um... I don't know <laughs> what is next. So I, I am discovering more and more each day that I need to be, need to maybe learn more about being a mother. Um, it's a very, very new role that I found myself um, 
being a mo mom has never been a part of my plan. Not because I don't love children or anything. It's just because, I, like I said, my condition, eye condition is, is uh, congenital. And so we don't know if or whether it would get, get passed on. Um, there's a very, very narrow chance. And nobody can say it's it's like lottery. It could surface a, at any generation, and so that has uh, never been part of my plan. But now I have a three-year-old, soon to be four-year-old, um, and you know, being a mom, I am discovering that it it is so much work, and it takes a lot of patience and time and effort. And just like I said, it. At the end of the day, you're exhausted, but the next day you have to start all over again and do it all over and over again. But every day you love it. You, you, you know, um, you discover new things about your child and yourself. And so I think I want to watch my son grow and um, be part of his life as much as I can. You know, I want to pursue a career. I want to uh, have an active professional life, which my husband is very much in favor of because he says, when I don't have stuff to do, I, <laughs> I'm not pleasant to be around. <laughs> so, you know, I do want to do, be active, but I don't, I don't know what, which form it might take yet. You know, so, and I think that has always been the story of my life. You know, I've never really made plans because I had very low expectations of um, maybe of, of society um, growing up. Uh, I, I did know that I could do things and I did want to do things, but I, on the other hand, I had very realistic understanding of, of where society was. So I did really expect much. I didn't expect myself to be, um, you know, a very, very successful person by the definition, by the general definition. But I always was open to opportunities and was open to working hard to get there. So I think whatever is, whatever life has for me next, um, wherever we end up next, I will just probably be myself and, you know, try to see opportunities wherever we may end up. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess that kind of leads into the second question, I think is sometimes I think people get so, so hung up on having a plan and that might actually limit you in many ways because you might say, I really, really want to be, um, I don't know, a, a, a journalist. But then we move all the time, you know, we, I have to follow my husband and blah, 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 this and that. And so it doesn't happen. Um, but in a way, when you have low expectations, I'm not telling people to have low expectations, <laughs> but I'm just saying that in my case, it worked out that way. I was not only blind, but also I was a middle child. Um, and in Mongolia, I have I'm one of four siblings. So my oldest sister being the oldest had a lot of responsibility to bear. And my brother, older brother being the only son had a lot of responsibilities and attention. And my youngest sister being the youngest, she also had a lot to live up to, but I was the middle child. <laughs> so people didn't expect much of me. They just wanted me to be there. And so it was very oddly liberating. So sometimes, it is very liberating to have, to be open to different opportunities as, as maybe messy or directionless that might seem. I think what we need to work on is ourselves, our self-discipline and determination and those kinds of core qualities instead of building a resume or CV or experience or whatever, you know? Um, and then, so once we build up those core core qualities in ourselves, then whatever next opportunity presents itself, we can live up to it. You know, we became, we become, what's the word? We become um, uh, fluid, right? So, sorry, I, I think that was- no, a that is, it's, 
perfect, Bianca, because that's exactly what we try to talk about in Empowering Perspectives is how to shift our perspective from limiting to limit less and to being blocked from being blocked by all that we don't or can't have to all that we do and can have. And yeah. yeah, and and your story really is the epitome of all of those things that there were so many obstacles in your way and you didn't let them stop you. And you may not have had a clear plan from the get-go, but every single time an opportunity arose, you grabbed it, not just lightly, but completely by the horns and and really leveraged every single new experience that came your way. And wow, the impact that that has had on you and every single community in which you've lived. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have wrapped some people the wrong way. I mean, <laughs> we all do, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's part of it. When you're asking questions that sometimes makes people nervous or angry or whatever it is, but asking questions and pushing the envelope is also another way to move things forward. And yeah. going back to that quote that you had about, you know, by Dr. Dana Whitley, those two choices to accept conditions as they exist or to accept the responsibility to change them. Right. Yeah. Either you can live with it or change it, but stop complaining. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go do this thing. Exactly. I mean, I'm not saying I don't complain. I do it all the time. <laughs> no, we all but, do. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all do. We have to. We have to for our mental health. But, but yeah, at the core, we need to be aware of, you know, yeah, we need to have a need to have a need to have a general strategy or philosophy in life. Uh, and like I said, one of my rules is not to complain unless I have educated but my other rule is not to take myself too seriously <laughs> so I think that's a very good life rule or philosophy those are very 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 good rules well Uyanga thank you so much for your time today um, I want to if anybody has follow-up questions for Uyanga or wants to get in touch with her directly go ahead and email me at, through the Empowering Perspectives. You can write out to um, hello at ep-community.com and we will provide a personal introduction between you and Uyanga so that you can continue the conversation if that is your desire. Um, I will also invite all of you guys to join our new Facebook group, which is Empowering Perspectives Global. We are going to have that as a new online portal or another means of connecting and providing announcements for upcoming events and helpful job search resources, being able to connect each other and let each other know about new opportunities that we can leverage in each one of our cities. And if you have a story that you wanna share or know someone that you would like to highlight to this group, please be in touch. We want to hear about those topics, about those people and to expand our horizons even further. Also, if you'd like to start your own Empowering Perspectives community in your city, we want to talk to you. So reach out to me because this community, these stories that we're sharing, these resources that we're sharing, it's something amazing that you can do to bring people together, help lift each other up and help each of us move more quickly towards the purpose that we are all supposed to individually fill. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Uyanga. And we'll see everybody really soon, I hope. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.